Hello and welcome to Silver Threads. Today's creepypasta from Reddit compilation will start with a short story about a bizarre world where plants devour and murder humans, followed by the tale of a lost girl who seems like something isn't quite right with her. I'll also be joined by fellow narrator Dodge This82. She does similar content to mine as well as a variety of other content such as gameplays, arts and crafts, and other randomness. She's a fantastic creator and I recommend you check out her channel below. Now, let me tell you a story. On the afternoon breeze, the dandelion seeds floated as pollen bombs, ready to detonate. The children ran through the short grass, trying to avoid them, but most were unlucky. The seeds' delicate contact causing them to explode with vengeful fury. The field of hungry wildflowers were soon painted with the scattered fragments of the young. Swaying grasses leaned over and drank the immature blood. Seven of the thirty children survived breathlessly reaching the end of the savage meadow. They rested on the crumbling road that separated the wildflower field from the crop field. A defeated Ford Cortina nestled in a nearby ditch, smothered by pumpkin vines feeding off its metal shell. One of the girls, Mara, grunted and pointed down the road. Another, Polly, shrieked and pointed the other way. The argument was settled when Mara pushed Polly into the crop field. The remaining six laughed and shouted in guttural speak as they watched Polly be dismembered by the patty pan vines. The squashes clamped onto their victim's body to feed. The sun rarely slept in these summer months. Near permanent daylight buoyed the plants with vigor, and the frequent rainfall surfeited their thirst. Eons of adaptation and genetic strategy had made the plants resilient, dangerous, and single-minded. Mara opportunistically grabbed a large, fleshy part of Polly that hadn't been secured by the greedy patty pans. The children fought over it, gorging on the human shrapnel, blood smearing the road. The other children now looked up to Mara, for now. After feeding, they walked along the road. They watched the wind escorting the myriad sizes of pollen, ranging from the invisible to that of a grapefruit. They sought soil rather than hosts. The children, always dressed in what protective clothing they had stolen or inherited, kept their distance where possible. As the few short hours of night arrived, the children lit a fire, crackling in a flame. The dry, living branches wriggled, crying out as they slowly burned. The children grunted like swine as they huddled around for warmth. When she awoke that morning, the two boys were missing. Mara was about to leave without them when they reappeared, covered in strawberry leeches and squealing in pain. The boys were parsnip white in color, the blood slowly being drained out of them. The four girls left them behind and continued on. They soon reached the end of the road and happened upon a warehouse. All four snorted and bared their rotting, mold green teeth in pleasure. There might be food inside. Entering, the girls were fearful. Inside, the floor was wet with lichen. Mara pushed one of the girls onto it, who slipped and landed face down. It consumed her unapologetically. Before the other two could run, they too were thrust into the carnivorous fungus. Mara watched their exquisite demise. She walked back into the sun and removed her clothing. Her skin split just as a ripe seed discards its outer shell. And then she bloomed gloriously as the first and only Human Flower I've never been a flower before, but 
I am open to new experiences, so please have mercy, plant overlords. If you like that story, leave a like on the video to show your support. Subscribe now if you want weekly creepypasta and true scary stories. Enjoy the rest of the video. I decided to get some ice cream on a whim. It didn't matter that it was already in the 50s in San Francisco. Who doesn't like a little fog and mist with their ice cream? I need to stop asking rhetorical questions. It's an annoying habit. Anyways, I didn't normally walk that route. Not at 8pm on a weekday. But I did walk that route. And I did see her. I saw her walking towards me like out of a movie. The chill wind blew back her hair a little bit, and she was wearing a beanie like she always did when we were together. Her coat was that baggy corduroy with the high neck, the kind of jacket that's cute, but almost disgusting in its grunginess. I had imagined this sort of scenario a few times. I had imagined her shuffling back into my life. She always had this really annoying habit of dragging her feet. She used to always trip if she had too much to drink because her shuffling would just get worse and her heels would stumble over the cracks in the pavement. It was a maddeningly endearing quality she had. Ava! I yelled at her. I was maybe 20 feet away, maybe a little over eager in my introduction, but it was like she didn't hear me. Ava! I yelled again, quickening my steps toward her. And this time she looked up. She stopped walking. She took a step back. Ava! I said. I thought that was you. Excuse me? She said, voice quivering. I think you're mistaken. She took another step back. I reached out to her. It was her. She must not have recognized me in the lighting. Her voice was the same. Her look was the same. I smiled. Ava, I said. Don't be silly, it's just me. It's been forever. I just wanted to say hello. She stared at me. Hard. I shifted. I hadn't thought things were so unamicable between us. I don't know you. She said, and this time, her voice was hard and angry. Ava, I said. I'm... Sorry, I just wanted to say hi. I don't know you. She said, almost in a scream. I jumped back. She turned around to walk away. Wait, I said. I ran up to her and grabbed her shoulder. She flinched. Wait, I said. Just let me buy you dinner. I know things could have ended a bit better between us, but I also know you are who I think you are. Here, give me your phone. She pulled away. Don't touch me. Ah, I said. Okay, fine. Are you free tomorrow? If so, meet me at the La Takiria. Meet me at six. I'll buy you a burrito. That's the least romantic thing we could ever do. And there'll be lots of people around. I paused, trying to soften my voice a bit. I sounded so desperate. I just want to catch up. She walked by me, quickly, and glanced once back to make sure I wasn't following her. The next day, I was distracted at work. I kept thinking about my meeting with Ava. Why had she pretended that she didn't recognize me? I was a bit shook. Why did I insist she meet up with me for dinner? I thought back to the last time I had seen her. She was leaving my apartment, headed for a bus ride to Los Angeles. I wished her well. I didn't think at the time that she had been the one, and I know I hurt her. Still, I hadn't expected her to leave so suddenly. Such is life, I guess. I was just keeping her around for my ego. But the thing about Ava was that the longer she was gone, the more I realized how much better she made things. Like, she had this subtle presence that was sort of maddening. I felt like she had just become this unavoidable part of my life, and as a 25-year-old, I hadn't been ready for that. It had been hard dumping her, because there really wasn't anything wrong with her. I just wanted someone exciting, someone who would keep me on my toes. She accepted everything about me, 
and it was boring. It was so, so boring. Well, if it was so boring, then why was I walking to La Takiria? Why was I leaving 20 minutes earlier than I needed to? I was curious what brought her to the city. Curious as to what she was doing now. I wanted her to be doing well. I waited outside the door. It was really cold outside, but I was sweating. So I didn't mind getting some air. People looked at me as they walked inside. I held the door for a few. The girls smiled at me. I tended to have that effect on them. Even I'll admit that I'm handsome. As douchey as that sounds. She didn't show at first. I was disappointed, but I stayed just in case she was running late. Ava had always been punctual. Something that used to bother me. If I say come over at 6, I'm probably not going to be free until 6.30. Everybody knows that. Well, maybe she finally got a clue. Because she showed up at 6.25. Well done, I thought. She learned a thing or two from dating me after all. I smiled at her. It was a little weird. Maybe I was misremembering? But she looked the same as she had the night before. Her black boots were the same. Her jacket. And I guess I don't really know what pants she had been wearing. But there was her beanie, too. And her makeup was the same. Whatever, I thought. If she's visiting, she probably doesn't have many clothes packed. The thought of her just visiting made me kind of sad. Hey, pretty lady, I said, holding out my arms for a hug. She had always liked that, but this time, she smirked. Not the nice kind of smirk. It was like a, you're making an idiot of yourself, smirk. I frowned. Jay, she said, smiling. Sorry to keep you waiting. I laughed. I knew it, I shouted, going to hug her. Why did you pretend not to know me? She shrugged. I wasn't expecting to see you. It caught me by surprise. She paused. I didn't think I wanted to see you again. I smiled. Well, I'm glad you changed your mind. What would you like to eat? She looked at the line. Oh, nothing. She said. Ah, uh, come on. I countered. Since when did you stop liking burritos? It was almost our turn. I don't really eat burritos anymore. I still ordered what I thought had been her favorite. She looked at me, almost angrily. I told you I don't eat these. I waved her off. You don't have to. I said, I'll just finish it if you don't. We sat down. It was packed, per usual, and the table was dirty. She seemed uncomfortable sitting. She reached out for the burrito. She looked surprised when she took a bite. <laughs> wow. She said, chewing slowly. <laughs> it's as good as I remember it. I chuckled. How long have you been away from San Francisco? I asked. She stiffened. Hmm. Well? She said. Uh, I've been here a while now, to be honest. Not sure how long exactly, but, uh, at least a few months. What happened to L.A.? I asked. She looked at me. I guess I wasn't meant to make it in L.A. We sat there in silence. I started to blabber on about what I had been up to in the years since I'd seen her. She seemed very interested. She chewed the burrito slowly, much slower than I was eating. I could tell she was savoring it. And that made me pleased. I was happy that the way to her heart was still food. Like before, the more time I spent time with Ava, the more I started remembering the things I loved about her. The way she blinked twice when she was confused. Or how she rested her face in both hands when she was deep in thought. I started forgetting why she had left in the first place. Had I really dumped her? I looked into her face. It was still beautiful. Damn, I had let a good thing go. I shook my head. Hey, I'm really sorry about how we left things, I said. I didn't mean to hurt you. 
her body language changed. You're sorry? She said, slowly, like she was being sarcastic. You're sorry? She looked angry. Yeah, I said. You shouldn't have gone. You know me, I push away people I care about. I tried to grab her hand, but she snatched it away. I told you not to touch me. She almost snarled. I was hurt. My bad, I said. Should we grab a drink or something? I have a feeling that could do us some good. Or at least you'll be drunk enough to not remember the stupid shit I say. I didn't think she'd be down, but luckily, she followed me out. I took her to a spot near my apartment, a spot we hadn't been to together. I don't remember this place, she said. Yeah, I said, after ordering an old-fashioned and a beer for myself. I figured you could see something new. I know we used to always go to Trip Dog. I wanted to take you near my new haunts. I ordered a rum and coke for her. She took a sip and then shuddered. Uh, it burns my throat, she said. I chuckled. Come on, you used to drink like a champ. For the first time that night, she laughed. It was a great laugh, with her head thrown back to the sky. <laughs> No, no, you were the one who drank like a champ. <laughs> she punched my arm, lightly. It felt good to have her touch me. I laid the charm on thick. It was starting to look more and more like she would come home with me. I pounded some more drinks. I was getting really nervous. It seemed like she was judging me as I drank. I definitely started getting a little sloppy. I invited her back thinking she wouldn't agree anyways, but she did. Where are you staying? I asked her. But she just told me we should go back to my place. I live by myself in a studio, like I did when we were dating. She had moved in for a few weeks, but it had been too suffocating, and then she moved to LA. I switched apartments, and that was that. My furniture arrangement was basically the same though, and she looked a little spooked. Did you airlift your shit here? She asked. It's just how I remember it. I shrugged, kicking some clothes on the floor into my closet. I was never the neatest. Do you want something else to drink? I asked her. I could hear the slight slur in my words. She smiled. You sit here, she said. <laughs> just tell me where you keep your glasses. She must have remembered that I always kept my alcohol above the fridge. That made me smile. Sure thing, I said. Shelf to the left of the fridge. I could hear some rattling from the kitchen. She came back with two glasses filled with bourbon. Her hands were trembling slightly, and I wondered if she was nervous too. That made me feel a bit better. Ava, I said. I've really missed you. I'm so glad we ran into each other. I took a swig, wiping my mouth messily. It's like it was meant to be. She looked at me, grinning slightly. Yes. She started. I think you're right. It was meant to be. I hugged her. She stiffened, and I was going to say sorry, but I knew she couldn't resist me. She never could. I started unzipping her jacket. It had that high collar. When I saw the bruises, at first I hoped they were hickeys, but then I could make out the finger marks. What the fuck? I said. She was looking at me. What? She asked. Aren't you going to keep going? You always kept going before. I was confused. What happened to you? I asked. She smiled. Aren't you going to tell me you love me? She asked. Aren't you going to keep pretending that everything is fine? That you didn't hurt me? I was confused. What the fuck is this? She unzipped the rest of her jacket. There was a knife. My kitchen knife. 
hidden within the jacket. Don't you remember? She asked. Don't you remember telling me how easy it would be to dump me somewhere? Where nobody would find me? Like, near the ice cream parlor where you left me last year? She grinned. I turned to make a mad sprint for the door, but she was ready. She stabbed me in the back. I gasped and fell down in agony. She stepped on me, pinning me down. Don't you remember, Jay? <laughs> she laughed. I was supposed to go to L.A. the very next day. I would have fucking walked right out of her life. But you couldn't handle me leaving on my own accord. I always did everything for you. I did everything you said. <laughs> she twisted the knife more, and I groaned. Oh, when I finally couldn't take it anymore, when you fucked up my life and isolated me from all my friends here, I got the courage to leave. Either way, I would have been out of your life. So why did you have to kill me, huh? Now, I could hear a cry building, but... I was too panicked to feel bad. There was no way what she was saying was true. She left me after I dumped her. She left me after I dumped her. Oh, shit. There's no way. I gasped. If what you're saying is true. Trust me. She said. <laughs> I didn't expect to be able to do all this. After you strangled me, I bet you thought I was dead. The last thing I remember is you tying the bag. I was still alive, you know. I was still alive when you fucking dumped me. I had to die smelling trash. <laughs> oh, oh, I have been wandering those fucking streets for a year. I thought it was my purgatory, my damnation for wasting my life on such a sorry loser of a person like you. I started circling near the spot you dumped me, wondering if I could find out what happened to my body, if anyone ever found me. I couldn't touch anyone, people couldn't hear me, and then I run into you, and you can see me, you can hear me. I, and other people can see me. <laughs> it's so fucked that even now, you're the person that makes me seen. Makes me feel alive. But you know what? I'm not alive. I'm dead. And it's more worth it to me to see you suffer than it does to feel alive. She shook her head. <laughs> I can't believe you went back to the spot. <laughs> I can't believe I finally get to leave you. <sighs> she made me type this all. She made me call the police and confess. I figured it would be better to have a chance at survival and spend my life in jail than it did to die with her driving a knife into my back over and over again. Maybe I'd share her fate if I let her do that. I do know that after I heard the sirens approaching, after I blubbered her a final apology, she screamed, I'm going to LA! <laughs> and away she went. Woo! A huge thank you to my patrons for helping support the channel. 242 Reads and Miss Creepy Tales. If you want your name on here and to support the channel, links to my Patreon below. Also, a huge thanks to Dodge This 82 for doing the voice of Ava. Her performance was fantastic. If you liked the video, there's plenty more where that came from. Click the playlist on the screen for another creepypasta from Reddit compilation. I do also upload every episode to the Silver Threads podcast. Thank you all for listening, and I'll see you next time with another story.